Hi, my name is Dr. Mary Casey Jacob. I'm the psychologist at the Yukon Center for Advanced Reproductive Services. I'd like to speak with you about how you can prepare yourselves emotionally for the IVF cycle you're planning to undergo. This is a big deal for almost everybody, and knowing a bit about what to expect can usually be helpful. I'm going to start by talking about the medications and the injections. Now, some of you will have used these medications and injections before because you did insemination cycles with them. And I will ask you to just hang in there with me because I'll get to other topics that I bet will be less familiar to you. For those of you, though, who have not used these injectable medications before, thinking about using them is often one source of anxiety as people wait for their cycles to begin. And I'd like to tell you what it's like for most people as they go through these treatments. The good news, in my opinion as a psychologist, is that most of these injectable medications are very tolerable from a side effect perspective. Almost everybody does feel fatigued when they use these medications, and you should expect that. And we make sense of that in a couple of ways. For one thing, your body's working hard when you're taking in these medications, so there is a lot going on in there. But also, as people enter their IVF cycles, they're often carrying with them a mixture of hope and dread. You wouldn't be doing this if you weren't hopeful that it would work for you, that you could be successful here. But many of you are also fearful about what if it doesn't work. And when we carry that kind of hope and dread inside us, it often translates into a mixture of muscle tension and fatigue. So we do see the kind of fatigue that people report as normal and something that you should expect. What else might you encounter? Well, if you're going to use one of the medications that shuts you down hormonally at the front end of your cycle, you might encounter hot flashes. These medications, when they're used in larger doses for other purposes, sometimes cause mood changes. But on the doses that we use for IVF, that rarely occurs. But about half of you who use these medications will experience hot flashes. And for those of you who have not yet had the pleasure of a hot flash, let me tell you, it can range from the mild end where you just spend a lot of time saying to other people, is it hot in here? And they say, no, it feels fine to me. And then at the other end, you can have this dramatic, out of the blue sweat that's really annoying. And it doesn't usually last more than about a minute, but it can happen again. So some of you will encounter hot flashes. The other thing that some people experience on these medications that shut you down hormonally are very mild headaches. But that's usually it for that group of medications. Then, when you move on to the medications you're going to take to stimulate your ovaries to produce multiple mature eggs, here's what we see. About half of you will report that you feel completely normal. And if we check with those who love you and are around you on a daily basis, they'll agree that you seem completely normal. So they won't impact your mood. You will start feeling tender in the abdomen toward the end of the cycle because your ovaries are taking up more space in there and it becomes a little bit uncomfortable. But from a mood perspective, half of you will be just totally yourselves. About 10% of you will report to us that you feel better than you've ever felt in your entire lives and you just feel well in a way that's hard to understand but very nice to experience. And then about 40% of you will experience some mood changes and they tend to be very mild. And that's one of the reasons I like to talk about this because if you're taking daily hormonal injections and you had big fat mood swings, you'd be able to make sense of it because I know that's what some of you are fearing and anticipating. But mostly if we see mood changes, they're subtle. I actually call them a magnification of a normal mood. So most of you will report that the flavor of the mood you're experiencing is exactly right for the moment. It's not weird or out of the blue, but it feels like a little bit of an overreaction for you. And what's really interesting to me about this is that it can happen with positive moods as well as negative moods. So it's not just that you might feel more sentimental at a you know SNET commercial or uh, more upset when something happens that would always upset you. But you might find yourself laughing out loud at things that usually barely tickle your funny bone. 
So this can be disconcerting if you don't know what's going on. But I want you and your partner to know that this can happen, and I want you to plan on blaming it on the drugs. That's the coping strategy here. Not trying to overdiagnose it, not really trying to change it, but more just remembering, oh yeah, she said this might happen, it's normal. It will go away when your cycle is complete. It's not anything to worry about. But it is common for about 40% of the people who use these injectable medications in our program. Then, when you move finally on to the injectable progesterone following the embryo transfer, most of you will experience no additional side effects from a psychological perspective. But a few of you will experience a curious flattening of your mood. And this is because progesterone is actually a natural depressant. Now we rarely see it causing depressed mood, but what we do see is that it can flatten both the ups and the downs so that people are just less responsive in general while they're having the injections. And this is weird. For example, you could receive a positive pregnancy test and your response could be, oh, that's good, that's what we wanted, huh, honey? And of course, you're expecting to be over the moon if we're able to give you positive results. So it's very weird if you have this flattening response to the progesterone. But even if you have that response, it will go away once your pregnancy starts making its own progesterone and you are able to stop using the injection. So we don't worry about it at all. We just help you remember that it's normal even though you wish it weren't happening. So those are the main things about the medications. I cannot tell you that nobody gets big fat mood swings on these injectable medications, but I can tell you it's very rare, maybe one or two in a thousand. More common if you have mood changes at all is just this magnification of normal mood. Now, the other part about the medications, of course, is how you get them, and that's via injection. And I want to say a few things about the shots. The first thing, if you're new to all of this, is that I want to assure you that if we thought you would mess it up, we wouldn't let you do it. We've been training people to do this on their own, in their own homes or wherever, for decades. And we will get you through this if you're new to it. What I want you to think about is whether you need any help in advance if you are fearful of injections. Some of you I know don't anticipate any difficulties with this or you've done injections before. Some of you feel anxious about injections and you're expecting to hate it, but you know you can do it. And then some of you are frightened of injections. I always tell the story about my husband who was a big, tough, weightlifting champion kind of guy but terrified of needles. Even if somebody on TV picked up a needle in a medical drama, for example, he would have to close his eyes. He was so terrified. So if you're like Mike, if you're frightened of needles or phobic of injections, I want you to ask for help immediately. It's a very treatable condition. I'm pretty good at helping people deal with it, but it can't happen right the day before your cycle begins. I need two or three or even four weeks to work with you before you begin your cycle. So call tomorrow for an appointment if you need help with being frightened of injections. If you are merely anxious about injections and you always look away if somebody's taking your blood but you can make yourself do it, you're going to be fine and in fact by the end of your IVF cycle you're going to have less anxiety. The most effective strategy, the most effective treatment for needle anxiety or needle phobias is what we call exposure therapy. So by virtue of having to do injections on a daily basis, most people actually stop being anxious by the ends of their cycles. And you see if that happens for you. In terms of coping with the injections, I want you to think about who's going to give the injections. I'm aware that we tend to talk to you as if we get to decide that, and we expect that if you're the woman attempting to conceive, you will give yourself the small subcutaneous injections that come before egg retrieval. And if you have a partner, we expect that your partner will do the progesterone that follows the embryo transfer. But don't let us decide for you. You should think about this, and you should consider multiple variables as you decide. This is an example of where good copers will think, what would comfort me? 
what would soothe me. So this is not just about who's afraid or who's available. It's also about things like who's the biggest control freak and should that person be in charge of the injections? Do you have a sister or a friend who's a nurse who would love to help and you would welcome her help? Perhaps she's going to do the injections. There's no right or wrong way to do this, but really you should be thinking about what would work for you. Regardless of who you plan to give the injections, we ask that everybody involved in the treatment cycle learn how to give the injections. So if you have a partner, we hope your partner will also learn about the injections, even if the partner's not going to be the primary person to give them. And we hope you will learn about the injections if you're the patient, even if you plan to have your sister give you your injections. And the reason for this is that the people trying to have a baby need to be the boss of this. You need to know exactly what must happen, and you need to be able to monitor the process to make sure you have the correct medications on hand and that the correct dose is being given at the correct time. No matter how much your sister or your friend loves you, they are not going to be as invested in the cycle as you are. So you really need to be the boss of this. And partners, I have something special to say to you. You may be sitting there thinking, gee, honey, I'd like to help, but I'm like Mike, and I don't really need to get over my needle phobia because I'm not the one that's going to get the injections. If you're in that boat, I double dare you to think about learning about the injections. And here's why. It turns out that being afraid of having a needle stuck into you and being afraid of sticking one into somebody else are two totally different things. And I'm not sure I'm smart enough to have figured this out on my own, and I haven't read about it in the research literature at all. But I see it again and again. And I first saw it my very first week on the job I've been the psychologist at the center now since 1991. And my very first week on the job, I had a patient who came for help with a needle phobia. And in those days, all the injections were bigger needles that needed to go into muscle rather than fatty tissue. So it was more challenging even then. So this lady walks into my office and I look at her and she looks at me and we both think, I know you from somewhere. And we figure out it's because when I gave blood at the Red Cross blood drive shortly before, she was the nice lady who took my blood. That's what she did for a living, was take blood. And she's in my office then saying, I can't imagine sticking a needle into my thigh. And I thought, that's really interesting <laughs> because you had no trouble sticking a needle into my arm. So ever since then, I've really sort of double dared people in this situation to see if they can't learn to give the injections. And most of you will be able to do that, even if you're still anxious about getting injections yourself. You will, most of you, learn how to do this by watching an online video. But if you need hands-on coaching from your nurse, they will be willing to help you. You just ask for what you need. So you let us know if there's any way we can help you prepare for the medication and injection side of things. Now I want to completely change topics and talk about stress and fertility. If you have been trying to conceive for a while, and especially if you've told others that you've been trying to conceive for a while, Almost certainly some helpful genius in your life has said some ridiculous thing like, relax, it'll happen or it'll happen again. Adopt and you'll get pregnant. People have all kinds of things they say to friends and family who are trying to conceive. And many times people will say, you've got to relax. Stress is causing part of this problem and you have to be less stressed. And of course, having that said to you just makes you feel more stressed, doesn't it? So what's the evidence for the impact of stress on conception? Well, I'm a medical psychologist or a health psychologist. Different people call, call us different things, but I come from the branch of psychology that specializes in research that looks at the impact of psychological variables on physical body processes. So we look a lot at the impact of stress on different kinds of health conditions. One of the things we've learned is that in this kind of research we have to separate stress into at least two categories. One category is the day in and day out perfectly predictable stressors that we, some of them we all experience like not having enough money or enough time, things like that. 
but some of them are unique to us but still predictable. Our mothers always say the same things that make us want to cry or our neighbor keeps popping out babies like there's no tomorrow or you know we, we have things in our lives that keep happening. So these perfectly predictable stressors are one category of things. The other big category of things are unpredictable, out of the blue, usually scary and maybe life-threatening. They can be natural disasters, they can be a sudden illness or death in the family, they can be somebody's serving overseas in the military and is out of touch and you're worried about them, but it's really things completely out of our control and unpredictable. Now, interestingly, in some areas of health, for example, diabetes, we can show that the day in and day out stressors absolutely have an impact on blood sugar levels above and beyond medication, diet, and exercise. All by itself, it makes an additional difference. In fertility, we can show that the out of the blue, scary, and maybe life-threatening stressors can have an impact. They can cause you to ovulate early or late. They can kill off your current crop of sperm that you could have ejaculated tonight, but you'll make a new batch. So when the out of the blue stressors impact fertility, it's always a short-term shock to the system for this month and maybe next month, and then the body recovers. What we cannot show with any strength is that the perfectly predictable day in and day out stressors have an impact on fertility. People talk about it as if it's a well-known fact. I hear physicians talk about it as if it's a well-known fact. But the research is terrible. There are as many studies suggesting no link between day in and day out stressors and fertility as there are studies suggesting there may be a link. And the studies that do suggest there may be a link can't be replicated, which is very important in research. If something's really there, we should be able to show it again and again. But we can't with the day in and day out stressors. So if you have been worried about this yourself, or if people in your life have been saying to you, you've got to relax, I really want you to take away the message from me that I don't see the evidence for that. I wish I did because I'm pretty good at helping people manage their stressors. And if we thought it was a significant variable, we would be urging all of you to come see somebody like me before you do your IVF cycle because we would think it would help increase the pregnancy rates. But we don't think that. We have me available because we want people to be able to manage their stressors and to feel as well as they can while they're waiting to see if they can have the babies they want. But I don't think anything I do helps people get pregnant or stay pregnant. Same thing is true for attitude. Every week I hear from someone in my office that one half of a couple thinks the other half has a terrible attitude. There's no point in doing this IVF if you're going to go into it assuming that it's not going to work. So in my world of health psychology, medical psychology, we call that optimism and pessimism. And we study those variables too and their impact on health. And they do sometimes matter in health. For example, if you are a lifelong highly skilled pessimist, you are more likely to struggle with depression at some point in your life than if you were uh, an optimist. It doesn't cause depression, but it, it affects how you respond when difficult life events occur. But what about fertility? We cannot show that optimism and pessimism have any impact at all. Now, I know some of you, if you've been trying to conceive for a while, and especially if you've had a, a lot of lack of success, or if you've had pregnancy losses, you may have adopted pessimism as a strategy for coping, even if you're not a lifelong pessimist. But you may feel that if, if I don't get my hopes up, maybe it won't hurt so much if it doesn't work. So on the one hand, I wanna to say to you, that's okay, I don't think it'll impact your cycle either way, so I'm not troubled if you do that. But I also wanna to say to you, in my experience, it doesn't make it hurt less. It hurts like the Dickens no matter what if you try and it doesn't work or if you try and get pregnant and lose a pregnancy. It always hurts. So I'm not sure it's an effective strategy, but it's not a worrying strategy to me. The only time I worry about somebody being pessimistic is if your attitude is so rotten that you're not going to follow directions. You know, your doctor and nurse are going to give you a protocol and they're going to ask you to take your medications at certain times, for example, and with certain regularity. 
And if your attitude is so rotten that you think, oh, what difference does it make? I'm never getting pregnant anyway, so I'd rather go have a drink. Then I'm going to worry about you because we know that compliance to the medical regimen does have an impact on pregnancy rates. So we do want you to be able and willing to follow the program that your physician gives you. If you want any help with coping, stress management, that sort of thing, you can ask somebody like me. We have a list of other therapists across the state who do this sort of work and who know about fertility and family building issues who can help you. And I can also recommend things to read if that would be helpful. From a coping perspective, it is always my recommendation that if you're a reader, whether it's online or books, it is always my recommendation that you focus your attention on reading about coping and not on trying to learn more medicine than your doctor already knows. Really good copers focus their attention where they get a vote and not where they don't. And you can't be a physician and you can't control the outcome of your cycle. And putting a lot of energy into trying to learn a lot of medicine is usually just agitating for people and not comforting. Putting your attention where you can do things that help you feel better in the moment while you wait to see what's going to happen is helpful for people. So, you know, I already suggested you could think carefully about who will give you the injections because that could help you cope. And let me make a couple of other suggestions about things that might help you cope better, feel comforted and soothed. Another way of thinking about it is are you the boss of the stress of this IVF cycle or is it the boss of you? We can't make this completely stress-free for you. This is too big of a deal. But we can try to help you prepare so that you are making choices as you go along that will help you feel like you're the boss of the stress instead of having it be the boss of you. For example, who have you talked to about your plans to begin IVF? If you have a partner, this is a conversation you should have with your partner. Do tons of people know that you're watching this video and preparing to undergo the treatment or just a few people? There's no right or wrong to this, but this is a really good time to say, what are the choices we've made so far and how's it working for us? Lots of people share with many others early in their fertility saga because you're excited, you're looking forward to having a baby, you're optimistic about the doctor being able to help you. You may have friends who've gone through infertility yourself and you feel like you can talk to them easily. There's all kinds of reasons people tend to disclose these things. For many people, the farther they go into this infertility world, the less helpful it is to have so many people know about it because others are not always good at saying things that are comforting and soothing, even if they really care about you and they want to help. This is a good time to say, do we want to take some of our privacy back at all? Or alternatively, if we haven't told a soul what we're going through, is it time to let some people know that we're in the struggle of our lives? How do you do these things? Well, for those of you who've been very, very private, and I know if that's you, you have good reason. You may be very private because it's nobody's business, because you're private in general, because you're pretty sure your family and friends won't support the choices that you're making, or they'll be intrusive with all of their questions and their asking. But if nobody knows that you're suffering, then you have inadvertently made things harder for yourself in most cases because it means you have to act happy when everybody else gets pregnant. You have to go to all the baby showers. You have to hang out at the family parties. You have to do all the things that for many people with infertility are really painful. Because why wouldn't you if the world thinks that you are child free by choice? So for you, you may find that it's helpful to just let this much out. I, I call this letting the tip of the tail of the cat out of the bag. And what that means is, you know, the next time somebody says, so when are you guys going to have kids? You have the way you've been avoiding that question, but you could instead choose to look the person in the eye and just say, I, I wish I knew. We've been trying for a long time. It's not going well. 
and I don't want to talk about it. It's too private and it's too painful. But if I seem sad sometimes, or the reason I sent a gift to the baby shower instead of attending myself is because we're going through this and it's really hard. And the person's almost certainly going to ask a question anyway. And you just have to stick to your guns and say, no, personal, private, painful, all prayers and fertile thoughts are welcome, but I don't want to talk about it. You don't have to share your diagnosis, your treatment plan, how long you've been trying, your successes or your failures. You don't have to share any of the details, but you could stop pretending that everything is a-okay. And for many of you, that could be a real help. For those of you who have told tons of people what you're going through and you wish you hadn't, I think there are two main strategies that can help you take a little bit of privacy back. One strategy is to think if you have people in your life who actually listen to what you say and who would love to know how to be helpful to you. And those people you can just be honest with and say, thank you for being my friend and for letting me talk about the infertility so much over this past period of time. But I'm finding that now it's not as helpful to talk about it. I'm, I'm going to go in my cave or we're going to go in our cave for a little while now. And you know we'll tell you if we have good news. But what you could do now that would be helpful is to not ask how things are going or what the next steps are or if I have any news. Instead, just ask me about work or friends or family. Just treat me like a regular person for a while if you could. I think that would be really helpful. So we all have some people who would say, thank you for telling me, I can do that. And that's one solution. But we all also have people in our lives who don't listen to what we say and who are kind of busybodies. And maybe they love us, but still they're intrusive. And they're going to ask a lot of questions no matter what. And for those people, the main strategy is to learn how to not answer their questions. To learn to be willing to say, I don't want to talk about it without feeling apologetic and without being mean. I think women in general are terrible at this. We tend to answer everybody's questions no matter how intrusive they are. And we tend to give loads of detail when we do. I, I have three brothers and I think they're great role models for doing the opposite. You know, if I ask one of them, what are you doing tonight? They shrug and say, I don't know. If I say, where are you going? They're like, out. You know? And if you have role models like that in your life, maybe you could practice those short answers that tell no real information. And that's what we have to do with the people who are no nosy and intrusive. But certainly, you can stop sharing detailed information. If people say, when is your next cycle? When is your egg retrieval? When will pregnancy test day be? Choose whether to answer those questions or not. Think about how many people do you want to know when pregnancy test day is, because then you're going to have to report to all of them. And if it helps you, if it comforts you to report to all of them, then do it. I'm not trying to suggest that privacy is a better strategy. I am trying to suggest it's a choice. And you're not stuck with the choices you've made so far. How do you want to handle pregnancy test day? Do you want lots of people in on it, whether it's good news or bad? Or do you want to be private about it for a time? Think about this in advance and lay the groundwork for it. Another area of coping where you get a vote in your IVF cycle is to think, how are you going to handle being out of work for so many appointments? Now, if you're the person attempting to conceive, you've, you've got to do all these appointments, the ultrasounds and blood work in the morning, and then, of course, the retrieval and transfer. If you have a partner, we encourage your partner to be there as much as the two of you would find it helpful. Uh, for some people, par for having partners come to every appointment is very difficult. And for some, it's not helpful. So again, think about what comforts you and what soothes you. If you have to get out of work for appointments, I strongly encourage you to have a plan in advance for how you're going to handle it. Are you going to tell people at work what you're doing? Some of you have already done so, and some of you plan to do so. And our experience commonly is that people pitch in and help to cover your absence. Wanting to be a parent is a really normal desire, and most people get it. And fertility treatment is so common now that 
many of our patients tell us, when I told my boss what I was doing, he told me they did it or his sister did it or whatever. So you may get support and people who are willing to cover your absence or a boss who's willing to have you you know, work through lunch or whatever so that you don't have to use your personal leave or vacation time if you're fortunate enough to have them so that you don't have to use those things for treatment and you can save them for the maternity leave that you hope to have. If you are not going to be open at work about what you're up to, how are you going to handle this? My advice to you is to have a plan and to lie as little as possible because most of us are lousy liars and it just gets people speculating about what we're up to. A strategy that can work really well is to go to your boss in advance and to say, I'm going to be having some medical tests and treatments during such and such weeks this month or next month because the team will be able to give you a window of time when all of your appointments will occur. So you go to your boss, you say, I'm going to have to have a number of appointments. Most of them are going to be first thing in the morning so that I will need to be late for work. How can we work this out? Your boss doesn't have a right to say what's going on, what's happening, or to demand any details. You have to be willing to stick to your guns if they do ask, but you could make it all legitimate because if you are absent frequently, people will start to talk and sometimes they'll worry that you're sick or something terrible is going on or sometimes they'll think you're not taking your job seriously, but you don't need either of those headaches in your life. So I do encourage you to make a plan in advance and work it out with your boss if you have to report to somebody and if you are ordinarily working first thing in the morning. Another area to make choices for yourself is uh, how are you going to handle pregnancy test day? For those of you who are new to our program, here's how it works. You will go to your doctor's office first thing in the morning and have blood taken for your pregnancy test. And the results will come back sometime in the morning. It's a little bit hard to predict exactly when. And at some point that day, your nurse will call you with the results. Now this is an example of a perfectly predictable thing that I encourage you to be prepared for. Many of you may wish it was your doctor calling with your results, but that will almost never be the case. The nurses make the calls, and you can always speak with your physician another time about what's happened, but in order to get the news to you as quickly as possible, it's going to be your nurse who's calling. Now, choices. Which of you should they call if you're doing this with a partner? And which of your many devices should they call? And can they leave a message? Think about how you want this handled so that you are not on pins and needles and jumping every time a device vibrates in your vicinity all morning long. Let yourself know a little bit about what's likely to happen. And if you came in that morning to have your blood drawn with a written down request for call this number, leave a message, don't leave a message, um, please call the home number and leave a message. We will come home early from work and get the news together. I don't know what the best plan for you is, but if you write it down and it's something your nurse can do during the working day, your nurse will do her best to make it happen the way you want. And this is a great example, again, of trying to make choices where we have power instead of focusing our attention on areas where, where we have so much less power. I also want you to think about what you have going on in your life once you know when the IVF is scheduled. There will be a period of time where you are taking these medications, probably feeling fatigued, having a lot of doctor's appointments. So it's great if you can clear the decks of extra responsibilities. We do not suggest or encourage people to take time off from work for their cycles, but we think it's a great time to not be giving your sister a baby shower or to have a lot of entertaining going on. It's really a good time for you to hunker down and take care of yourselves. And think about how you're going to spend the waiting period between pregnancy test day and when you get the results. That can be one of the most challenging periods because there's nothing you could do except take your progesterone shot every day. So what, what you can try to think about doing is building in some distractions for that period of time. Can you plan a luncheon date with somebody who doesn't even know you want to have a baby? So that's not what you're going to be talking about. Can you have a weekend away with your partner if you have a partner? You know, how, what can you do to make those days pass? And then what are the supports you've lined up for yourself to help you 
when you get your results. And for many people, you need supports, whether it's good news or not, because you know you're going to be anxious about whether the pregnancy is solid and continues. And if you haven't conceived, of course, you're going to want support for that. So be thinking about the things that you can do to comfort yourself and soothe yourself. I also encourage you to think quite a bit before you make your final plan with your physician about a few of the medical challenges that you face. You will have watched a video on the medical side of things and you will have learned about things like how much we want to keep down the risk of multiple pregnancy, about the use of ICSI, about the use of assisted hatching. These are all things for you to have talked through so that you can go to your physician with any of your questions or concerns. What I especially encourage you to think about is how many embryos you will allow to have transferred. Your physician is going to make a recommendation to you that's based on our research, on national research, and on what your doctor feels gives you a good chance for pregnancy but also keeps the risk for multiple pregnancy quite low. The real challenge, I think, comes because the final recommendation for how many embryos to transfer is made on the day of the transfer when the team sees the number and quality of embryos that are available to you. And this means that the final recommendation may be made by a physician who is not your regular physician. Because as you've learned, the way our team works is that certain doctors do retrievals and transfers on certain days. And so while your own physician will be behind the scenes all the way through your cycle, that final morning of transfer, you may be speaking to a physician you don't know well. And they may be making a recommendation that's slightly different from what you and your physician have planned. What I encourage you to be thinking about in advance is, am I flexible about what my physician and I have planned? Would I agree to take any additional risk of multiple pregnancy if the embryo quality is low, for example, would I let them put an additional embryo in? There's no right or wrong answer to this either, but what we want is for you to have a vote. And if you haven't thought about it in advance, it's very hard to do so on the morning of embryo transfer. You're nervous, you're anxious, you're most likely to just defer to what the physician is saying. But really, your physician wants your brain in there as part of the equation too. So mull over the possibilities in advance. So these are just a few ideas about things that you can be thinking about and doing as you prepare for your IVF cycle. We want to help you in any way we can. We want to support you through this as much as possible. Please let us know if we can help in any way. I wish you the best of luck and hope things go very well for you.